Okay, Dad. Um, so in our last conversation, you mentioned that one of the reasons the TikTok ban was moving forward was because of all this horrific footage coming out of Gaza. Um, and actually, just this morning, um, I was on Twitter and I listened to a recording where the head of the ADL was saying that there is a TikTok TikTok problem that uh, needs to be right. addressed. And um, the ADL is the Anti Defamation League. It's really an anti Semitism organization whose main purpose is to go after anybody who speaks poorly of Israel or right, Zionism. Right. right. Anti Semitism, very broadly defined. Right. Um, so. Uh, it just shows that support for Israel is plummeting, and it's easy to understand why. Um, if you've seen any of this footage, which I have, these horrific videos being of women and children being blown apart by the IDF, it's, it's hard to sort of see to justify what the IDF is doing here. So when you, people are witnessing these atrocities, you can easily see why support is plummeting. Um, and then it just made me start to think, like, well, who is still actually supporting Israel today? Um, and why? I know that certain governments are, but are there any nations whose populations, the majority of the populations, actually support Israel and what it's doing in Gaza? Right. I think, well, the U.S. may be that one nation. There may be some others, you know, perhaps some of the Eastern European countries. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, in the U.S. You think I, the majority of Americans support I, what's happening? Oh, the last I checked, you know, like you say, you know, um, support for Israel is is dropping. Um, and so at some point it may, uh, you know, uh, support for Isla Israel may no longer be a majority position, but the last I checked it was. Do you know the percentage? I is don't know, percentage? actually. But I it is know. a majority. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure that it, it still is. Um, and in the, it may no longer be a majority in, um, among, um, Democratic Party voters, um, but overall, it is a majority. Um, and one thing is that we're seeing a shift. It used to be, you know, this was, there was really very little dissent on the, on the, um, on the blue state side. I mean, it was, uh, uh, Democrats in general were very strong supporters of Israel. Um, and now that, and Republicans, perhaps a little less so, like up through the 60s, you know, um, and into the 70s. But over time, we're seeing a shift where um, there's now more and more support for Israel on the uh, the right side of the, the but political spectrum. But that didn't used to always be the case. No. When no. Israel was first created as a state, they didn't have much support amongst the right or the conservatives? I don't know if there was much opposition, but um, it was, you know, it was Truman, a, a Democratic um, president who did it, um, who... who um, gave uh, the U.S. imprimatur to you know, the creation of the state of Israel. Um, it was Eisenhower, Republican president, that pulled the plug on the, the, uh, that Suez Canal uh, escapade. Um, and, it, you know, unlike Biden now, who is giving unqualified support to Israel, when, when uh, Israel, oh, I think it was along with Great Britain and I think France as well, um, attempted this uh, to seize the Suez Canal. Um, he pulled the plug on it. He says, mm -hmm. "You know, you're not doing this." You know, he called up the respective government leaders and said that, uh, that you know, this is over. And of course, Biden could do that now with Gaza. Um, but Eisenhower did it back then. You know, he he wasn't afraid to challenge Israel. It was a very different time. Um, yeah, but now we're seeing. A shift, um, you know, from the left generally to the right. Uh, there, you know, there's still a lot of support, very strong support, you know, on the the Democratic side, uh, but that tends to be older, you know, it tends it's establishment. But among the grassroots, among the younger folks, mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, opposition to Israel, and it's growing. And 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 it's that opposition, you know, existed before October seventh. And the war on Gaza, um, but it has certainly grown by leaps and bounds since then because of the atrocities that are being committed there. Okay, so there's the older generation seems to be more sympathetic with Israel, uh, at least with the, in probably yeah. both the Democratic yeah, I've, I've and seen Republican the, side. Yes, right? on both sides. I've seen the polls. Yeah, the, so right. the Demo older Democratic generation, they're just right. 
they were more favorable to Israel in the past, in right. the 60s and 70s. Yeah, and old, so they, old habits die hard. Right, right. old habits die hard. But uh, then on the right side, where is the support coming from? Because it seemed like it wasn't as big of an issue as what you're insinuating. Right. In the, the, during the creation of Israel in the early days, 60s and 70s, the right didn't have as much, uh, didn't seem to care as much. Is that fair to say? I think that's or, true. You know, I, um, uh, you know, you certainly you found dissidents on both sides, um, you know, people that opposed Israel. Um, and it's now it's very, very hard to find dissidents on the right. Um, so why does but, the right have so much support? For well, Israel? I think there's kind of two things I would point to. You know, one is Christian Zionism, which is is a, a relatively new phenomenon in in Christianity. It, it you know, it barely existed before the 1960s. It existed only on the fringes of Protestant Christianity. Uh, so it didn't really have any influence on uh, the political landscape. But after the 1967 war, the Six Day War, um, there was um, just a kind of a, a Israel captured the attention and some for some reason, the, the hearts of a lot of evangelical Christians. You know, there there's a there are, there are particular reasons for it. I, I you know, I heard that there were certain seminaries that were already kind of Zionists or Christian Zionists. You know, they were they didn't have much of an impact, but um, they managed to um, through uh, arrangements that the details of which I don't know and I don't pretend to know um, to educate a whole generation of ministers and. Um, and inculcate them with you know the principles of Christian Zionism. So Christian Zionism has has grown as a real force. Um, it's, I think, truth be told, it does have yeah, it certainly has a, a real impact because there are you know millions, I guess tens of millions of Christian Zionists. You know, there's certainly a lot of them around here. I see the bumper stickers. I see the Israeli flags. I mean, not everywhere, but you see them. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of my, a lot of my friends, um, you know, that I grew up with around here, you know, are Christian Zionists. My my neighbors as well. I remember I talked to them a couple months ago. Um, the or I guess it was maybe a month after October seventh, and right. you know, she was just saying Hamas has got to go and right. all, all, all this, and you know, I didn't get into it, but you know, they're. They're, yeah. they're they're nice people, right? right. <laughs> they're they're they're, right. they're Christians, but right. it almost yeah. feels unchristian oh, in yeah, support yeah. of the, yeah, the right. sport. So I certainly think it is. How do they I mean, square it away? How does it, uh, as a Christian, how do you, uh, how do you say that this is somehow justifiable? Do they draw some biblical interpretation? Right. Well, it or? is. In, it is. Um, you know what we would call in the you know the Orthodox Church. Uh, a heresy, a just a, you know, a, a false teaching, something that's not in, in any way um, consistent with with um, the teachings that were handed by, down by the church over the centuries. I mean, one of the most, I, I'm not going to go into the, the, the weeds of this, but kind of one of the most basic um, you know, aspects of Christianity, you know, what sets it apart from Judaism is that we say that, that, that that when Christ came, he established a new covenant. The old covenant was with Israel. The new covenant is with the church. And, and somehow, um, and that was well understood for centuries and is still well understood by churches in most of the world. Um, but somehow, you know, the Christian Zionists kind of managed to um, hold these, which I say just essentially contradictory ideas in their head, you know, that we have the new covenant and the old covenant. Somehow the old covenant still continues and has to be respected. You know, the special relationship between God and Israel. And so the Jews are somehow are, are a, a holy people, yet at the same time, you know, they're defined as being the people who, who rejected Christ. So it's a, it's a hard, um, right. hard thing to explain, but it's something that people have somehow... I, I think it's not, you know, it's not a matter of logic. It's a matter of emotion. The people were excited by, you know, the victory of Israel in the Six Day War. You know, there was a time of great tension. There was fear that, uh, which I think was greatly exaggerated, that Israel would be defeated. And then they they achieved this lightning victory. They attacked the Arab armies and defeated them in six days. And it thrilled a lot of people. And uh, Israel became kind of a, 
uh, this was at the time of the Vietnam War, which was not going well for the U.S. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, Israel became the darling of of, of, of the right. Yeah, yeah, the right. You know, it's like hey, yeah, these soldiers know how to fight. You know, right. they can kick butt. <laughs> you know, these are, and I think that's a lot of it. And you know, to honest to God, I think that you know, it's sad to say it's true of a lot of Christian Zionists. Because in the end, it's just deeply unchristian. It doesn't make sense, you know, the, the, in, in terms of the Bible or theology or and just in the Christian spirit, mm. you know, most importantly. It's, I, I remember talking with the, the mother of one of my good friends. Um, and this is after I came back from a trip to Israel and the West Bank maybe 13 years ago. Um, and she, she and I was just kind of giving my position on it, what I saw there. Um, and she just looked at me and told me like, Charlie, God gave that land to the Israelis. That's that belongs to them. God gave it to right. them. So, and it's hard to, when somebody has that type of faith, uh-huh. it's hard to argue against it, you know? And I, I think this is also the faith of a lot of Israelis. They just say that this is, yeah. this is, it's a divine right almost. And so right. you're dealing with a kind of a different force here, uh, I feel like. But where did that idea that God gave this land to them amongst Christians? And, and is this right. also just something that's an American phenomenon? Are there Christian Zionism? It doesn't really exist in, uh, let's say, you know, you're talking about Orthodox Christianity in Eastern Europe or Russia, uh, Greek. Is this a, no. something that is held, a belief? Um, you know, certainly among individuals, um, but... Yeah, I, I, I think out of the U.S., outside of the U.S., you'll find it, but I think it's really a phenomenon that is kind of subsidiary to the to U.S. Christianity. I mean, the the U.S. has sent a lot of missionaries and established a lot, a lot of um, you know missions in different countries around the world. Um, so you know, for example, um, your your mother's aunt you know belongs to a kind of Pentecostal church and she has the same kind of views but it's a Pentecostal church that was brought to Taiwan by um, by American Pentecostals mm. and so you do find like you know members of these kind of these America linked U.S. linked churches you know around the world that that um, are Christian Zionist mm. in their orientation. Uh, how would you respond to somebody that says God gave this land? to the Jews and right. the Israelis. So, well, what, yeah, what, I'm not very you... good at arguing theology, but I would point out that, look, this is, you know, you're, you're pointing to the Old Testament. This is, you know, this, we understand as Christians that that, that uh, the Old Covenant, we understand as Christians that that no longer applies. You know, we live we live in a new age. So a new what covenant. do you mean by the old covenant? Because people right. might confuse the old covenant with Old Testament. That's not what right. you're saying. Right. Or... Old covenant is like, okay, and a covenant is an, an agreement. So it's mm. a, basically an agreement between God and Israel, right? And you can see that in the, the you know the early well throughout the books of the Old Testament as you know, um, yeah, <clears throat> and you know it's developed you know, you know over time, and then finally, you know, we say that, and, and this includes the idea that I will send you a Messiah. Now, we Christians say the Messiah came, you know, as Jesus, Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And when he came, he fulfilled that Old Testament prophet, prophecy. That agreement was, you know, that had been made was fulfilled. And now there's a new relationship that has been established you know, between God and the world, not God and, and Israel. Um, and, you know, that was something that all Christians basically understood and, until the Christian Zionists. And yeah, they so they brought back in essence the old covenant. So it's almost a, a antithetical to the, the to Christianity. Yeah, in a sense, right? I think it, I think it really is. It's just it's not it, it, it. So I mean, you could argue with them, but I think in the end, it's just not logical. I mean, because they, you know, they're trying to base it on scripture, but scripture doesn't support them. I mean, they they have to limit themselves to Old Testament scripture, but Christians don't do that. They have to. For Christians, the New Testament comes first, and the Old Testament is just understood through the New Testament. Mm. And, and I, I, sorry, I didn't quite get where it originated. You said that there were a few, you know, uh, Protestant theologians in the, the, the right. 50, 60s, and it was the 67 day war where it just became right. Well, that's six just day for... war that where it became popularized, and a lot yeah. of 
Well, I just captured the, you know, the imaginations of a lot of people. And I, I think of especially, you know, at that time, again, it was like the Democrats were solidly behind Israel. Um, but it did capture the imaginations of all kinds of people, including people on the right and, and unfortunately, including a lot of Christians. And there it was, you know, it's hard to explain how sometimes these irrational things achieve such force. But, you know, it seems to be the, the excitement about Israel, this kind of this new uh, darling of, of um, let's say, jingoistic people, people who, <laughs> who, who, who love armies and wars, you know, which is like the, the U.S. was failing at that point. You know, the U.S. was in the Viet, uh, Vietnamese quagmire. Mm. And, it, you know, it just was very disappointing for, for people who like to wave the flag. Mm. And, but they, they found, they, I think they could get a vicarious, you know, of course, it's easier to understand the Jewish support for it. I think it's more rational. I mean, up to a point, you say, you know, this, these are our, my people and they won this war. I'm proud of this. I'm excited. Mm. But for a lot of Christians, it was um, a lot of Gentiles. It, it was a vicarious kind of uh, patriotism, you say, a patriotism mm -hmm. that somehow extra, they identify that, these are our guys yeah. somehow. And then, the, you know, the, the thing is, again, like I've been to, I remember visiting a friend's house, he had a big Israeli flag there. He didn't have an American flag. He had an Israeli flag. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a strange relationship that we have. There's right. so much support. Right. I mean, it, it's still hard for me to wrap my head around where the support really came from. It's just, yeah, well, yeah, it is. It is rather a str very strange phenomenon, but it's very real. I guess you have to point to the fact that, uh, which makes people uncomfortable, but that it's just true, that um, Jews, though they only account for like 2% of the population, um, exert a dis disproportionate influence, you know, on, on media and on the culture in general. Um, and... You know, well, to this day, you know, Jews are certainly, you know, organized uh, Jewry. You know, you mentioned the ADL, and of course, there's APAC. There, there are there are countless, you know, a myriad of, of uh, Zionist organizations run by Jews, and they have a tremendous impact. Mm. Now, you know, they are, as we well know, in the younger generation among Jews, they're beginning to these younger Jews. A, a significant. I was going to yeah, ask a fraction about the, of them are the breaking merit. away, right? And in a very, I would say, very heroic way. I mean, they're um, you know, people like Aaron Maté and you know Max Blumenthal. Those are right. you know, come to mind right away. But there, there are many. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman Finkelstein has been out there He's for quite the a while. He's one of the old guard. Yeah, yeah. right. I um, remember him saying that it's it is a completely different landscape amongst uh, Jews in America. He used to be a lone voice 20 years ago. Right. Now he's just one amongst the sea right. of voices of opposition. Right. So we, so we get something. We are seeing a, a shift with, you know, that has rather huge implications. Um, the, the, you know, a shift from the left to the right. It's not that it's disappeared from the, you know, the left half of the political spectrum by, you know, not at all. They, you know, they have still have tremendous influence, but it's, you know, I, I think it's a it's a fading influence and it's the influence that's going to die off with the older generations. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's, they're still extremely powerful, like the number one um, donor to the Democratic Party is uh, Saban. You know, who, who he, he, he himself said, I'm a one issue guy and my issue is Israel. Mm -hmm. And he actually on the on the Republican side, the number one donor was Adelson. It was basically this. I don't know if you ever use those words, but that that too is what he operated by the same principle. Now Adelson passed away a few years ago, but well, his widow is the organization that he established is still there, you know, pumping money into the political system. Well, what's the loyalty that these top donors have? Are they Israeli citizens, or are uh, they often they are. You know, they're dual often citizens. dual citizens. Yeah, they're often dual citizens. Are, are, are dual citizens allowed to operate in the United States government and Congress? Can you be an Israeli well, citizen? Well, they certainly they certainly do. Yeah, there's no question about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they, these are people that are just fiercely devoted to Israel. And it used to be you had, and you still do. I mean, people who are leftists in every way, um, but were, you know, fierce advocate, fiercely Zionist, mm. fervent Zionists. 
And one thing I was struck by, uh, you maybe you were struck by the same thing, because I know that you too went to, to Israel and Palestine. Um, when it, during my trip there, which was about 12 years ago, more or less, um, I remember, see, I grew up in, in, a, in Berkeley, you know, a city that with many Jews, my best friends were, were Jews or half Jewish. And, and you know, I was sur surrounded by them. And, and of course, Berkeley is a very leftist city. And I just always identified like political activism on the left with Jews. Now I was going to the country of the Jews. And I thought, well, I, this is going to be a country full of political activists. And they're all going to be leftists. And then you find the actual dissidents in Israel. You can oh, almost man. count them on one hand. I mean, right, I mean right. that's an exaggeration, but they yeah. even then, you know, like twelve years ago, or they were they were a real rare breed, and they were really out on the fringes. They had really no say, you know, in the in the workings of government there. Um, so it's it is an interesting um, phenomenon. You say that leftist Jews. So they're left in the U.S., but when it comes to Israel. The vast majority of them become, you know, extreme nationalists. Right. So it is. I think it's just they see leftist um, philosophy as being beneficial to Jews in the U.S., but not in Israel. Right. It gives them that feeling of you know, we're all equal, and you know these uh, sort of these ideals that are very popular amongst the left. But then when you look at what's happening in Israel, it's the opposite. We don't want any of that equality. Right. And since then, <laughs> right. And of course. Yeah, since then it's become much more extreme. You know, it's just like Israel just keeps on going in a, a more and more extreme nationalist direction, to the point where. Well, yeah, why is that? Why is it going more? Well, I think a lot of it is demographics, from what I understand. It's just that, okay, it was the the old guard in Israel were the, the secular Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, um, the liberal Jews, who, but they just didn't have as many children and, and it's the um yeah it's it's the the orthodox jews the sephardic jews you know the the, the, the what they call them the Mizraim, the, these the groups I mean, yeah yeah I, my yeah my grasp of hebrew is well doesn't exist <laughs> it's um but anyway yeah these these other jews the non-ashkenazi jews will say um you could say simply outbred them, and um, you now now they form a. I, I think that's part of it. I think it's probably mistake because I think even like within, truth be told, within the Ashkenazi Jews, there's just been a shift you towards. Could have the just right. moved the whole spectrum yeah, right, and yeah, everybody been, moves right, with it, and they're maybe right. a little bit more to the left, but yeah, everything the whole, whole shifted. Right. Well, and I think there's also kind of an internal logic. The the thing is that. Actually, this leftist universalism, we'll say, and, you know, multiculturalism actually just did not, um, was not consistent, not compatible, mm -hmm. okay, with with Zionism. Zionism, in the end, you know, it's like what... It's what not critic, multicultural. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> right. No, it's, it's, it is um, Jewish supremacist. It just is. Right, and it's just it, it was it was in fact you know just sort of a, a a juggling act that you say that could not be maintained you know being a Jewish supremacist and also being in favor of multiculturalism right. on the other hand, and eventually you know the interior the the internal logic of Zionism you can say simply won out, uh -huh. and and you know it was always about you know of course um, Israel was established. Um, by that great dispossession called the Nakba, you know, the, mm -hmm. meaning the disaster. Seven hundred thousand Arabs were driven from from what is now Israeli land, um, but which was Palestine, which had been you know their ancestral lands, um, and many, many, many hundreds or thousands were killed in in massacres, um, and that was all committed by secular Jews, Zionists, mm -hmm. right. Um, but one thing I, I, I sometimes I think the main difference is that those those Ashkenazi Jews they have this you know connection to Europe they understand European culture very mm -hmm. well they understand you know what um, uh, the U S you know many of them are dual citizens and go back they know how you know they know how to talk to people in the West they know how to present themselves mm -hmm. they know how to present their Zionists they know what. What will fly and what won't, you know, what what they what, what jives with who? Yeah, right. So so you know, uh, you know, there were real 
on on that Ashkenazi left, there were and still are a few real dissidents that oppose Zionism, you know, quite courageously. You know, that's you, you have to give credit where credit is due. But a lot of them, to be honest, said, you know, voice concerned about it, but never did anything about it. They just they let it happen because in the end, you know, they were Zionists. And, and the fact is, you know, it kind of they looked bad it made it felt a little bit uncomfortable or whatever. You know, each time, a, you know, maybe settlers seized a, more land within the West Bank or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they never did anything about it. Okay. Some of, you know, with a few exceptions. But now, those effect, exceptions have become so few that you can say that it, there's basically no, no right. opposition in Israel to Zionism. Right. Yeah, I think it's important to you know, use the term Zionism because you don't want to conflate Judaism with Zionism. Right. Would you say that the majority of Jews around the world are Zionist? Or... I well, okay, it really does vary by country. You know, again. I would say the majority of Jews, for example, in the U.S. are Zionists, but maybe no longer like within the, the uh, younger, population. younger population. This is a very significant shift. And again, you know, we're getting people out of that who are very courageously and effectively arguing against Zionism. Well, that's why we got, got rid of TikTok. Right? Yeah, because. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my hat's off to those people. Um, and... And then, you know, there are community, for example, there's a fairly uh, substantial Jewish community in Iran. I, I, I know, I actually just heard that. Yeah. I was listening to Alistair Crook, and he was talking about the large Jewish population with right. Iran, which is, see, doesn't make sense as a, if, you, if, you yeah, listen, right. if you're an American and right. you watch Fox News or whatever, right. you would never exactly. imagine. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, they have a, like, the, the Jewish community has uh, a representative in the Iranian parliament, and... It's been, you know, it's an ancient community that's gone back many centuries. Um, so, you know, they, they obviously are not Zionists. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then a lot of these, as I understand, the 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 Arabic um, Jews that were brought to Israel after it was established by the Ashkenazi Jews, many of them um, had actually were not Zionists. I mean, Zionists is, Zionism is something that came out of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it was foreign to actually Jews through much of the world, but, um, but the, the, that new government in Israel worked actively to bring Jews from all around the world into Israel and, and to educate them, to make them Zionists. And that, you have to say that they largely succeeded in that project so that we have most, um, most Jews are Zionists. You know, again, at, um, yeah, in the in the U.S., it's still true, but we are seeing a very important shift. And who knows? Maybe a couple decades from now, most Jews in the U.S. will not be Zionists. Mm -hmm. um, and, Interesting. Um, okay. Well, you know, you you were saying in the beginning how the the shift there's been a shift in the United States where people on the left used to be more supportive of Israel and Zionism and now it's moved over to the right but when I'm looking at help me square this away you know we got Joe Biden um, who is facing a tough re-election year he's very unpopular you know he's right. he's very old most Democrats don't want him as a, um, as their nominee and this as you said before What's happening in Gaza is hurting the Democratic Party right. immensely. So, what, what is the calculus that Biden's playing? Why was he, why won't he call for a ceasefire? This is clearly yeah. would be appealing to his, his right. base. We've stated that now uh, Zionism has gone more to the right and with Christian Zionism. Biden should not care. He, you think he would love to try to dunk on uh, the Christians or whatever? Yeah, you know, well, Christian Zionism. Yeah, but the thing is, it's still very much in the left among the older population. So is it just, well, he's about as old as he can yeah, get. Right. So is he, the yeah. older you get, the more Zionist you are? Or is that <laughs> I how think, it's working? Or? Yeah, I think you can certainly, you know, probably... Uh, um, but but still, he wants to get reelected, right? Right. This has yeah. got to be killing okay, well, okay. his... Right, well, I think, first of all, he is a real Zionist. He, he is a dead... He's throughout his life that he is reasserted his faith you know again and again he's made very strong st statements about his love of israel and his his faith you know in in zionism you could say um i think he's a true believer so that's whether or not it hurts him he might just feel like he cannot it's one of the few things one of the few principles that he has it's a horrible 
principle, but it's one that he really does have and he holds dearly to. Um, so even if it'll cost him an election, he, right. he thinks that he... But but there's another thing to look at, because even if, let's say, put that aside, he says, okay, yeah, I, uh, um, I got to get reelected. I don't care. You know, I got to do whatever needs to be done to be reelected and to um, um, defeat the orange monster, you know. Mm. Um, but there's it's still not clear what he should do from that perspective. Okay, yeah, certainly it is hurting him. Okay, among younger voters and Arab voters, you know, there was a hundred thousand uncommitted votes in the, in the Michigan. Michigan primary, and Michigan is a state that he really has to win. Mm. Um, yeah, on the other hand, I mean, the donor class is solidly Zionist. Do they have that much power? They have that money. Money really talks in politics. So That's, if he turns against, right. so does he think that if he calls for a ceasefire, decides not to support um, Israel, it will hurt his, that that the APAC, the 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 donor Jewish donor class or the Zionist donor class will be that damaging. I mean, he's getting yeah. the nickname nickname Genocide Joe. Right. Right. He can't. That's that's yeah. not a good nickname no, to have no. in a, an election year. No. Surely that's more damaging uh, yeah. than the money yeah. that APAC well, would give him. Okay. Well, I've let's well, see. I've heard that. Yeah. If you actually get inside a campaign, you'll be surprised. You know how much money really decides things. It's not. Well, okay, where's like this I, money coming from? Well, from donors. From and uh, you know. Um, Action, political action committees like APAC. Right. Um, where, where are they getting their money? There's just, okay. there's just a lot that was accumulated by yeah, the well, I mean, Zionist like, elites? Yeah. No, the, the, well, one thing, too, is like uh, Jews as a group are very, very wealthy. You know, they're a very successful group. And they, um, they donate to political causes at a much higher rate than any other group. So they have, there's a big war chest. Um, now, maybe one of these days it'll be turned in the other direction, you know, when the, the, the Max Blumenthal's and the Aaron Mates, you know, become the, the, the voice of, of American uh, Jews. And, um, and then we can see them as a real powerful force against Zionism. That could happen one of these days. You know, mm. there's nothing that's etched in stone about this. But at the present time, you know, those, those, um, those political action committees, those donors, they're solidly Zionist. And and again, you know, you, you'd be surprised, but I've heard this again and again. Um, there may be opinion polls, you know, that tell you, oh, this is really hurting you, but your donors are telling you something different. Most of these politicians do what their donors tell them to do. They think they... <laughs> so, so you think yeah. that's really what's playing in the calculus for Biden for everything. For right. example, just recently he was telling Benjamin Netanyahu, don't go into Rafa. Right. And he says, screw you, I'm going into Rafa anyways. Right. Well, what what kind of relationship is this? Right. Why, why isn't this damaging? Incredibly damaging for Biden. He looks first of all. It looks he looks weak. He has no. Right. He's not able to can't command the respect. He still gives munitions and yeah. he's funding the Israeli the IDF to bomb um, civilians in Gaza every day. Right. And then he sort of lends lip service like, oh, we need to help the Gazans. It's like, well, right. maybe you could start by right. stop sending them bombs or are calling for a ceasefire. Right. I think it's yes, yeah, it's it's, it's a purely a political calculation. Um, on the one hand, you know whether it's for uh, in order to maintain good relations with the donor class to make sure that the money continues to flow to him, or it's really a, a matter of his sincerely held beliefs. You know, he he wants to support Israel. Mm. He he. And on the other hand, he sees that, you know, it is hurting him and his electoral prospects. And therefore, he's come up with this. I think it's completely ridiculous, but I think it's real typical of U.S. politicians. The plan is to continue to support Israel without condition, any, you know, any conditions whatsoever. And Netanyahu knows that. That's why Netanyahu says "screw you" because he knows the the, the bombs are going to continue to be shipped to Israel, um, and he knows that the donor class is solidly allied with him. Okay, so he's going to continue to support them, but he's got to make noises. You know, he's got to express concern. He's got to say he knows he feels their pain, and and the hope is that somehow 
you know, he can square the circle and he can please both sides. But I don't think it's going to work. I don't think he can. I don't think so either, but that's what he's trying, you know. It's it's, it's amazing to me to to think that this is kind of, you know, what I used to think would be like, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy stuff. That the the Zionists within America have they have much control within our political system. Because if you look at any of the political uh, presidential candidates this year, they all are very Zionist. You know, somebody that right. I, I was really excited about early on was RFK Jr. Right. Because he was great about the Ukraine war. He was a sort of that old school Democrat, yeah. you know, right. anti-war. And I was like, this guy can maybe really do right. something for the country. But then once October 7th came, yeah. it was he just was full on board. We have to support Israel. He said right. some p- terrible things yeah. about Palestinians, right. saying that they're most the most pampered people, something right. like this, which was shocking to me. Yeah. yeah. How, how, and, you know, Trump obviously is very Zionist. Right. I think Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, is oh, looking at, like, investing right. beach Trump property in Gaza, already right. looking at, right. you know, yeah, like, okay, we'll just, yeah. right, we, we'll just yeah. finish this genocide and then we'll start buying up property there. Right. Trump also moved the, uh, the embassy to Jerusalem from Tel right. Aviv. So... D- d- there's no options, it seems like, for American right. citizens. Right. Like, you have to be, all candidates seem to, are yeah. Zionists. Yeah. Well, how is that possible? Why? Well, I think it's, um, it's, you know, it's a couple of things. It is money, you know, it's just like to run a campaign, you have to have, you know, you have to have the donors with you. Now, Trump was an exception. He could have told right. the, the Zionists, you know, to F off and a, but he didn't, because uh, he he seems to really believe in it himself, you know. Or um, and in the end, he did take a lot of money from Adelson. I remember back in twenty sixteen, mm. he did. Um, so he may have made just a purely political calculation, but it was probably more than that. He has these family connections, and what I understand is that RFK does too. Um, you know, with these these personal connections and um, the money. Um, and then, you know, the media, still the establishment media, you're starting to see some cracks now, like occasionally stories are coming out that, you know, you would never have seen before. Because, I mean, the, the reality is so horrible and so at odds with the narrative that I, I don't think they can, you know, bury it, hide it entirely. So it's starting to come out in some places like MSNBC. Right. But up until very recently, you know, they, the media spoke with one voice and it was... You know, if you're going to be a mainstream candidate uh, with any real chance of, you know, winning the presidency or a Senate seat, you you know, you can't be labeled a kook by the media and you would be labeled a kook. And maybe, you know, still now it's 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 an uphill battle. I think, you know, maybe things are finally starting to shift. Somebody could be you know, openly anti-Zionist and, you know, win a high, high position in the government. It, maybe. Is there is there any rational argument that can be made that somehow supporting Israel is in the best interest of the United States? Like, well, what, what argument are they making? Why, yeah. why? For me, it seems like this is a, a sinking ship and we're tying ourselves to it and going down with it. Our reputation is, we're all pretty much alone in this, right? Would you say right. the rest of the world? Well, okay, no, I mean, they're the Western European, the European governments are... Oh, uh, governments, yeah, but the populations, yeah, you see right. protests in right. Spain, yeah, in very London, large protests. in Madrid, right. Paris. Right, and I think like... that in the Spanish government, too, and the Irish government, those are two European governments that have become increasingly critical of Right, of but the, and we can also, would yeah. it be a fair assessment to say that the majority of the populations of these European countries oppose... Yeah what's happening in right. Gaza, uh, yeah, a post-Israeli state. Yeah, I think there's a, the opposition, the support for Palestine is overall as, is stronger in Europe than it is in the U.S. Um, mm-hmm. It always has been. Right. Right. Um, but uh, they do not do not have very responsive governments. I mean, I think it's that is just one of many examples where, um, you know, the, the elites are um, pursue one policy in the... Um, and the the population asks for you know a different one. It just the, uh, so so. What is the argument that the the elites are making to uh, for to the population, their populace, to say 
this is why we must continue to support Israel. Uh -huh. I just hear these sort of tropes. Israel's our ally. Yeah. But what else is there? What, what, right. what are they trying to sell the American people or the European people? Right. Why there must be continued support for Israel? Right. Like, what, well, what? I think, you know, one thing is that we haven't seen so much of it recently, but they're, of course, um, especially um, starting with 9-11, uh, there have been a number of attacks carried out by, you know, is, um, Islamic terrorists mm. and Israel can um, certainly can say, yeah, put, put itself forward as like the, the enemy of Islamism. Mm. And so for a lot of people who really don't look at things very closely, they just say it's kind of natural. These are the, you know, they see a fight taking place in Israel and that, and they assume, well, you know, I, I know these, yeah, these, they're fighting terrorists because these Islamic terrorists came to my country and they blew up a theater or they, you know, or they, they knock down the twin towers, or mm -hmm. um, so I think it's. It, it, How would yeah. you respond to that argument? I mean, there are have been some yeah. horrific attacks. I mean, obviously nine right. eleven, and there is that one in Paris at the theater where yeah. they gunned down over a hundred people. Right. You know, there are there have been yeah, these, yeah, or October seventh itself. Right. So just to right. say, yeah, how October would you seventh is a little. I I, it's, I understand yeah, that. Right. Okay, we won't get but, into that. But, uh, but um, yeah, no. Of course, there have been uh, undeniably atrocities um, c committed by um, Islamic terrorists on on European soil and American soil. Um, yeah, yeah. The thing is, was this does supporting Israel somehow stop that? Well, you actually find it's really the reverse. That. Terrorists, you know, terrorists who are actually are willing to sacrifice their own lives in a cause, and that's true of these terrorists. You know, they, they do terrible deeds. I'm not defending it at all, um, but they 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 only do so when they feel like their their people are you know, its very existence is threatened. You know, when they and if you look off in the the histories of these these the personal histories of these terrorists, it often goes back to seeing atrocities committed by the Israelis. And now just imagine what's happening, like in, in Gaza, how many future terrorists are we creating now? You know, how many people are just have this terrible sense of despair, this powerlessness, this rage? You know, this is a, these are all very natural and, um, I think, responses to what's taking place there. And, and you know, you feel like there's nobody cares, nobody's going to fight the Israelis, you know, nobody, and the Americans. Because let's be honest, you know, we're very much complicit in these and these horrible attacks. Um, well, I, you know, if I have to die by doing it, I'm going to do something. You know, mm. I'm going to, I'm going to attack the symbol of American power. I'm going to, you know, set off this bomb in an Israeli cafe. You know, I'll kill right. myself, but I got to do something. You know, I've just seen like, you know, my my aunt and uncle, and my kids were killed in front of me. You know, what am I going to do? Right. Yeah. No, I think you can understand when when you see some of these videos. You know, they're just really heart wrenching. Mm -hmm. Just children being blown apart. It's I can see how that could lead somebody to right. It's to, a, to it's, a, it's a life of vengeance. Yeah, it's the um, wrong wrong response. But it's you cannot say that it's you know it, that it doesn't have a cause. That it's completely irrational. That it's um, how, how dire is it the situation currently in Gaza now? I know right right now it, it, it you know the, the, there's been her horrific bombings and you know we have over 27,000 at least at least right. and, and this is actually what right. I think Lloyd yeah. Austin even said so this isn't people yeah. say oh these well, are numbers coming out of Palestine this right. is our own general saying right. you know the, yeah. so the majority well, I, well, of they, the, but these are basically like the kind of like the verified counts the thing is how many people are under the rubble you know how many people have died on, on streets because they couldn't make to the hospitals the hospitals have been blown up and and you know closed down or bulldozed or Whatever, because what they, you know, what the, the Palestinian Authority does there is, you know, they, they actually, they, they make a real count. They don't, don't just estimate, mm -hmm. but, you know, how many bodies, yeah. you know, they found were brought to the morgue are, and are, whatever. But, yeah, it could be much, it could be much, much higher. Let's, let's be honest. Okay. That's really, I think that's going to prove to be a very low count. But it's, but it's even if it's just 20, just 27,000. Well, well, right? I mean, I was going to say that, that 27,000 women and children. Is yeah, okay, right, right, right. We're and over 30,000 We're over 30,000 right. total, but uh, over 70% of the people being killed are women and children, right. which is just so horrific to right. think about. Right. Um, but now they're, they're facing something, uh, facing starvation. And I wonder, right. if, do you know how serious this is? I've been I... seeing some 
pictures and photos, but I don't want to yeah. jump to a conclusion. But yeah. I'm hearing reports that we're, we're looking at mass starvation right. where I think hundreds right. of thousands of people will die right. because we can't get them food because right. Israel is blocking the aid trucks. Yeah, from, from what I understand, it's that over a million are at high risk of starvation. Which is and basically it. half of what's right. left in Gaza. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's, 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 it, it's beyond horrible. Um, you know, when you, when you look at this, you're wondering, okay, well, it's actually, I'm, I'm kind of surprised by the amount of restraint uh, from the Arab nations, the surrounding Arab nations. Right. Um, and, and so what is holding them back? And then uh, how, how much trouble is Israel in? Because it seems like they are, they're, they're almost losing the PR war here in America, which right. is their, their stronghold, base, right. their base. The right. rest of the world... Yeah. We can take, say, Western European governments, but their populations don't support right, them. Right. And those Western European governments are in trouble yeah. because we, we talked about this before. Right. People like Macron and Schultz, they're down in a single digit uh, right. approval ratings. Yeah. Um, or, right. Possibly. Or at oh, best or, 20%. Right. Or okay. Very yeah, low. Right, right. Right. So uh, what, what, what is uh, Israel going to do about this? I, if yeah. I was an Israeli, just looking yeah, in the best right. interest of Israel, right. this does not seem to be in my yeah. best interest yeah. because I have to be worried about, you know, uh, Iran. Yeah. You, know, you got Hezbollah, you got Lebanon, you got Egypt. Mm. It seems like a lot of these these people are so upset about what they're seeing. Yeah. They're, they're chomping at the bit right. For, right. To, for to enact some justice against yeah. Israel. So right. what what is... Why is Israel continuing to do this? Is it just that belief in Zionism? Do they believe yeah. that the U.S. will back them up no matter what? Does Israel yeah. want a wider war? Right. Well, what, uh, that's a lot of questions. But. <laughs> well, I think actually Israel does want a wider war. Um, they have long been trying to provoke a war between the U.S. They know that they really can't take on Iran by themselves, but between the U.S. and Iran. Um, and... But, okay, so that's true. I think they do want a wider war. Um, and then why is it that they don't seem to care about what the world thinks, you know, about their reputation? You know, because their, their reputation has taken a severe beating. Right. I mean, they've, re right, there was... They, they're they're going to become a pariah state. Yeah, they already are in they, many, right, words, they're, many regards. Right, they're on the verge of becoming a pariah state. And that should be alarming. That should be, you know, for even the most... You can say the cold-hearted um, politician in in Israel who doesn't give a damn, you know, about any Palestinian kid or whatever. Mm. They could all starve to death, as far as he concerned, as he is concerned. Um, but even somebody who has that attitude, you know, is that hard-hearted. Um, yeah, he, he. You would think that these people would think twice and say, oh, well, wait a second, let's at least pretend to be, to care. Let's at least, <laughs> you know, right. Let's, let's do something. Maybe we don't want them to all starve right now. Let's, let's start feeding them. Right. Um, because this is really going to hurt us. Um, but I, I guess it's, you know, something has been a, a sense of entitlement of invulnerability, you know, has been fostered in, in Israel over the, the decades um, you know, Israel has been criticized again and again, but the U.S. always comes to its rescue. The U.S. always vetoes these U.N. resolutions. It stands alone yeah. in doing this. Yeah, but but I feel like every week there's a, a U.N. vote for a ceasefire. Right. And the U.S. is the only one that right. says no. Right. Um, yeah, you know, but but I guess they, they've come to just take it for granted. You know, that's how, how, how else can I explain it? Um, do you think part of it may also have to do with the fact that Benjamin Netanyahu was looking at corruption charges before October 7th yeah. and was actually looking at jail time? So he has a personal incentive to yeah, keep this war going? Yeah, I think that's true. I don't, I don't think you, that should be downplayed. I think that's right. I mean, when it's so over... This is one shot. Yeah, well, it's, so he has to, you know, for him, he's probably looking at this in an uh, apocalyptic terms. I mean, that he's... He's looking at his own destiny. He sees that it's wrapped up into, you know, with the destiny of, of Israel. And you, so, there, you know, it's it's time for the final solution, so to speak. You know, I... Um, and we get some pushback. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, somebody used that reason. I think it was actually the U.S.'s U.N. representative. Oh, really? But oh, anyway, <laughs> it was... <laughs> um, 
um, I, I don't think it's out of place in this case. You know, it's just to come right completely kill you know, or um, or drive out. You know, all the Palestinians from the land, so that mm. that uh, Israel can establish once and for all what I think was always the intention. You know, to have a unitary state of Israel, a mono-ethnic state of Israel. Do they no. really think that they could just get away with that without repercussions? Like, because, like we said, they're becoming a pariah state. They, they're losing yeah. the PR war. You know, after, really before October 7th, nobody was really talking about Israel-Palestine. It was kind of in the back burner, like, oh, yeah, you know, there's, there's right. some stuff going on there, but all eyes on Ukraine. Right. Now that this happened, it seems like global support is not... To get rid of Hamas, it's actually people are looking at like Israel is the problem here, right? And, and and that's this this looks like how much trouble is Israel in here? Like is I think it, they're in very big trouble, yeah. And it is actually again quite remarkable how few Israeli politicians seem to realize that. But I think it's just like the 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 mood in Israel is just so um, heated, and you know is. Um, you know the, the hatred, the fury, the, the fear. You know, it's just uh, the, the the emotional intensity is the, the emotional atmosphere is such that people are just not thinking straight. And actually, you know, to um, you know, all politicians actually look at the look at the domestic situation first. I mean, they do. Obviously, some of them have to consider you know foreign relations, but. Within Israel, they're they're only getting pushed from one side, and that is just to to kill more Palestinians. They they don't feel like that their nation is at risk. Uh, well, yeah, you well, know. you certainly should. I mean, if you're looking at it rationally, but they're just I guess they're not looking at it rationally. So 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 the you you said that you think Israel and Benjamin Netanyahu are wanting a wider war. Yeah. Um, and they well, will only do it if they know the United States right. will come in with them. Right. And it seems like Biden is just gives this unconditional support. So do you Yeah, but I think probably too. It's clear like for example, um, you know, recently when there was that, that outpost was attacked and if and what, three American soldiers were killed or Right, on um, the Jordan Syria border. Right. And then they launched this retaliatory strike. There was obviously a push for them to, you know, the strike, strike, around. strike around, but they fell short of that because I think they actually understood that um, um, Iran is not defenseless, you know, not at all, and you know, they that um, that Iran could retaliate in um, in a major way, and 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 so they. Yeah, so they blinked. They, you know, mm -hmm. they they didn't pull the trigger against Did, Iran, and I think they're re reluctant to do that. The, the, how do you think um, Israel would widen this war if they are wanting to do it? Do well, they do they want to attack Lebanon? Yeah, go into Beirut, go after Hezbollah. Right. Well, that's one way. I mean, Hezbollah is pretty closely tied to Iran. Hamas really is is not, but but Hezbollah is. Um, yeah, well, can you explain what is Hezbollah exactly? Because it's not a, it's not a national army. You know, they're right. in in Lebanon, yeah. well, in Lebanon, Iraq. Right, Lebanon is a very unusual place. <laughs> it's um, well, from what I, okay, they are Shiite Muslims, and that's why they're allied with Iran. The you know the Iranians are Shiites too, um, that live in the south of Lebanon, and they originally were actually pro-Israeli back you know before 1982. Really? Hezbollah. Yeah, um, because. Well, you know, the, the politics in in um, Lebanon is very complicated. There are many different ethnic groups, and um, but for you know whatever reason they leaned, they actually allied themselves or considered themselves to be uh, friends of Israel. But then Israel invaded Lebanon in 1982, and that ended that. They, in essence, that their invasion of of Lebanon in 1982 created Hezbollah. It was a resistance organization. And they have, uh, they eventually pushed the Israelis out. They just made the cost of the occupation too high for Israel and Israel pulled out. Um, and then later, you know, Israel, I think it was in 2006, um, it, attempted another limited invasion of Lebanon. And they, they were defeated by Hezbollah. I mean, they were, the, the the, the Hezbollah fighters proved to be very sophisticated and well-armed, and they were ready for the Israelis. Um, 
And since then, I think that, you know, they have been like building up stockpiles of, of all kinds of uh, precision guided missiles. And it's believed that if um, Israel should attempt another invasion, um, much of Israel, much of Israel's uh, infrastructure, uh, military infrastructure at least, could be destroyed. Um, that has, it's believed anyway that Hezbollah has that capability. Okay, um, so do you think that Israel will, will try to start something with well, they Hezbollah? It sounds yeah, like what you, what you just right. said, it sounds like a pretty good deterrent yeah, not to right. do it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm sure there's you know, they're aware of the, the problems. I guess on, on one hand, again, we're talking about Netanyahu and his um, his incentive to just keep things going. Um, and then I think probably too that he understands that he, that maybe he could not defeat Hezbollah on his own. You know, the Israeli army, the IDF could not defeat Hezbollah on their own. But um, they have the, the Americans right there now. You know, the Americans are just off the coast. And so you may see this opportunity to draw the Americans in. I mean, I think that's the hope. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you know, who knows? Hey, he's probably trying to just maneuver the U.S., you know, into, um, into a position where they feel like they have to, you know, uh, defend Israel, you know, if, if Israel goes into Lebanon that they'll have to join Israel in the attack. You know, again, it may be a huge miscalculation, but... Uh, How knows. likely do you think something like this Well, um, is? I mean, there's real pressure. I mean, there's signs that, that he intends to do that. They, um, there's been a lot of talk about it. And the fact is that what there, there are, I believe, like a hundred thousand or hundreds of thousands of Israelis that have been evacuated from northern Israel and are in hotels around the Dead Sea and you know other places. They cannot return to their homes because um, of fear of strikes from Hezbollah. And you know these people are getting antsy. It's a kind of a, a ongoing humiliation for Israel and Israel more than anything. And I think this explains you know part of their of the. Um, the savagery of the, the war that they're waging in Gaza, that they feel like their um, security depends on... How scary they yeah, are. Yeah, exactly, on fear. And they, they need to you know, maintain that kind of aura of invincibility. Um, they, they want all those you know, people in neighboring nations to be cowering before them, afraid, afraid right. to strike. But then they see... Um, Again, like, yeah, they, Israel had to evacuate these people. The people don't dare return. It's, mm -hmm. it, it kind of shows a weakness, doesn't it? A powerlessness on the part yeah. of Israel. And what they're doing in Gaza, to me, isn't striking fear. It just, I think they're yeah. conflating being, you know, looking like they're a major threat with just being evil. Yeah. Um, bombing innocent women and children and defenseless people is not... Uh, much of a scary threat. You're not going up against yeah. a real force, right? You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say yeah, they're not actually waging war against an army, but waging a war against yeah, the civilian defense, population. Defenseless. Right. That that creates rage. It creates future terrorists. It doesn't right. create, you know, any kind of healthy fear. Let's say. Mm. Okay. Um, well, I, I feel like we can continue on this forever, and I, I do want to explore this topic more because there's so many. Uh, paths to go down, but um, we're coming up to an hour, so I think it's a we can stop here. It's a good place. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dad. Mm -hmm.